finished up race and communication in the body. Now the coordination aspect. So it's fitting that we're talking about it today because we're about to take communion. Communion is all about us as a body of believers seeing our oneness with God. God being the head. God being the one that gives us all of our direction. Um, martial art, arts, I was taught that if you can control the head, you can control the body. Get the head in a headlock, where if you move the head, it controls the rest of the body. And it's the case uh, with the body of Christ as well. We listen to God the head. He can take the body where it's supposed to go. We will be in perfect coordination with him. So that's our subtitle this morning, understand what the Bible says about church government. As soon as you hear that word government, probably most of our minds go to corruption, uh, to something that's not good. Uh, boy, if we could just have less government, things would be a lot better. But understand that the Bible does talk about church government. Um, and it is something that God has designed. So I'll pray that this morning you guys have an open mind to that, an open heart to what we're going to explore this morning. And even thinking about what we as a church need to potentially do with our government, our constitution, and um, our church membership, and what that looks like, and how we can better align ourselves with what God has set up in the Bible. So church government, how do we allow people in the church to freely practice their spiritual gifts when we have a structured environment? Um, is it even possible? Is it possible to have uh, what we would call a balance between uh, the organization structure and your ability to allow the Holy Spirit to freely use you in this body to do what you want to do or what you are called to do. We typically see two extremes when it comes to church government. The first is a dictatorial structure um, where it's a very narrow uh, leadership at the top, um, in some cases even one person, and it uh, is they are telling you what you can and can't do um, in all aspects of your Christian experience. And it stifles individual spontaneity. Um, we'll give some examples of what that has looked like in the past and even in current days. The other extreme that we often go to in church government is to not have one at all. Uh, forget all the government, forget uh, Let's not even have designated leaders. Let's not have the structure. Hey, let's just get together and do this Christian thing. Um, all in an effort to encourage body life. All in an effort to encourage uh, what we believe the Bible has called us to live out here on planet Earth. I will admit that there are many times uh, that I've wanted to ditch all church government altogether. Um, I don't know if you guys notice, but I don't get real excited for church business meetings. The state of Pennsylvania says I only need to have one a year. And that's all we have, unless there's a big expenditure that we need to talk about or something else pretty serious. Um, I'm not saying the get meetings are bad or anything. I'm saying the state requires us to have one. We have one. We can have a whole bunch of other ones. We just don't have to record it for their sake. But I've wanted to ditch it so many times. I just said, just let's just scrap the building. Sometimes this building can be a headache. Lots of times this building can be a headache. Let's just ditch it. Let's start meeting each other's houses and just have a Bible study. That's it. We can just be a church family that way. If we moved in that direction, we would have to take our Bibles. We'd have to tear out large portions of the Bible everywhere where it talks about church government. 
Now, granted, our Bibles will be not as heavy, and it would be better for our backs and arms, but I don't want to take away God's word. If it's in there, it's in there for a reason, and he wants us to follow every single word. Now, in a knee-jerk reaction to a legalistic church, we often throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, if any of us have ever grown up in a legal church, uh, we're like, man, let's just forget it. Let's all forget it. But we need to know that God designed the local church to provide both accountability within the body, one towards another, and to provide continuity. Same message over and over again so that people can get it. For some of us, if you're like me, you don't get it the first time. Some of your kids might be that way. I already told them. Yep, well, you need to go tell them again because he ain't doing it or he didn't get it. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves over and over again. So not only did God design us for accountability, but also for continuity of the gospel message. We read the local church at Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas as missionaries who then reported back about their first missionary journey to the church. It's where we see um, some level of accountability. Hey, if we are going to give our missionaries money and support them when we send them out, we want to hear that the money that we've given them has been used towards God's purpose. So here we see in this case, Paul and Barnabas reporting back to the first church in Antioch, letting them know how that first missionary journey went. Paul uh, received missionary support from local churches. Again, accountability. Um, he collected offerings uh, to distribute to churches in Jerusalem. So even when he was on these missions trips, uh, they gave him money. He brought the money back, gave it to churches that were already established in Jerusalem. And Paul planted churches and instructed Titus to appoint elders. So here we read in our Bible that even, even at the first church, Paul was instructing people, Titus in this case, to actually appoint apostles. We read this in chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had. Pointed D. So as Paul was setting up churches, as he would go to one city and spread the gospel, people got saved, and he said, listen, I can't hang around here. I, I need to go to the next city and continue to preach the gospel. And he told Titus, appoint elders. Why did he do that? Number one, accountability. Two, continuity. Continue to allow this message to be preached over and over again so that people get well grounded in God's word. Foreign missions, even today, uh, like our, our friends, the Bowdens in Niger, Africa, they're not training Americans in their Bible schools. They're training indigenous people, people that are from that community, from that country, that look like everyone else in that country, speak the language like everyone else, dresses like them, has the same cultural. Why? Because it provides continuity. Granted, the Bowdens have been there for 14 years. I don't know if they're going to stay another 14. So they're planning these people and they're carrying out continuity and uh, accountability long after the missionaries have gone. So let's look at what the Bible teaches us about organizational structure within the local church. Kind of going to give a historical view of what man has at least interpreted when it comes to what church government should look like. Three systems, three basic systems that we see even today. Um, one is the Episcopal system, the Presbyterial, and then the Congregational system. We'll break all three of these down. We'll start with the Episcopal system. This is a system where the government of the church is basically formed by what we call bishops. Um, and you'll hear that term bishop in your Bible. You'll read it. It's another term for uh, what I would call a pastor teacher. But in other churches, the office of bishop is very different than what 
we would practice that same word. Uh, this typically happens in our Orthodox Eastern churches, Roman Catholic churches, and Anglican churches. They hold that only a bishop can ordain priests and deacons. The bishop claims historic descent. Okay, so somewhere in their past, in their family lineage tree, grandpa was a bishop. Uncle was a bishop. Somewhere up the line, you have to claim historic bishopship, if you will, um, from an apostolic or a some apostolic times. You find this you won't find this system in the New Testament anywhere. The problem is is that the Episcopal system comes a triangle. And the real estate at the top of the triangle is very narrow. There's only enough room for ultimately one universal bishop. Roman Catholic Church, that's called the Pope. Problem with anything like that when you have a head bishop or a top, top person at the top is that they're the only ones. We take this system, we run with it to its logical end. There's one uniful, universal bishop making all of the decisions. That bishop just happens to be a man. You know, man is infallible. That man makes mistakes, um, and that becomes the biggest problem. You're not going to find this in the New Testament. All right. The next system that we'll talk about is the Presbyterial system. Government by presbyters or what we would call also elders. First Timothy 5.17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. So we're all familiar with the Presbyterian church. Some of you maybe even worshiped in Presbyterian churches. Uh, this particular system tends to hang around what we call the Reformed church. Um, where we govern by Presbyterians or elders. Now, the Presbyterians make a distinction between a teaching elder and a ruling elder. And as we see this in 1 Timothy 5, 17, where the last sentence says, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. Um, so you have teaching elders and those that are actually teaching and preaching from the word. And then you have ruling elders. Uh, they don't preach and teach the word within the body of Christ, but they do help and assist in church business, in church, other church aspects. Um, so that's the second system that we still see today. Is this breaking up? The third one that we see that we'll spend the majority of our time on is congregational system. This is a government that tends to emphasize the autonomy and the independence of the local church. Congregationalists see God as the final authority. They see Christ as the head of the church and everyone else part of that body. I'm going to take you guys to several verses this morning to uh, show you where the congregational system derives its authority from. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, that is Christ. Um, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Christ is our head. He was the first fruit, um, if you will, of the new church, of the new testament, the new covenant. Because of that, he is our head. And there is there, because of that, there is a new special class of priests. Guys, remember the history? Uh, the only priests in uh, historic Israel had to come from the tribe of, some of you might be wearing these jeans today, Levi, right? You could only be from the tribe of Levi to be a priest. Yet Jesus Christ was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah, the roaring lion. So Jesus broke the mold. 
He said, I'm going to be the high priest, but I don't have any ties to the tribe of Levi. Bible's very clean. Hebrews, if there is a change in the priesthood, i.e. the priesthood is leaving the ordained tribe of Moses and Aaron to a new tribe, with that switch must come a new law. The tribe of Levi preached the law of Moses. We would you know the, the Ten Commandments and the 632 others. And Jesus took over when he rose from the grave. New covenant was ushered in and with it a new law, the law of grace. So with that, with him becoming the new head of the body, ushering in the new covenant, it created a whole new priesthood. And I'm looking at them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And if you continue to read in Hebrews chapter 10 up to verse 22, it clearly lays out that you and I are now priests. If we weren't priests, we couldn't enter the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> now we know because we read our Bibles, we know that in the Old Covenant, who was the only people that could go into the Holies of Holies and live to tell it? Priests. They were the only ones that were permitted to go in. God gave them special protections where they could go in to the presence of God and survive. And now, Hebrews tells us, because of the blood of Jesus, you and I are now priests and priestesses, you young ladies, and you can enter into the presence of God and live. Amen? We don't need an intermediary. We don't need some select person between us and God, as in the past, where we had to confess our sins to some person. Um, bring some animal that blood was shed. All of that has been done away with. The presbyter or the bishop only has authority within the local body and not beyond it. This is what the congregationals believe. If we elect a pastor teacher, if we elect a, a presbyter or a bishop, that bishop only has authority within the local body because you have given it to them. We do read of early church councils in Acts 11 and Acts 15. Okay, So we do read of the churches, multiple churches at some point in time in Acts, getting together to have some discussions. But we need to read exactly what those were for. These included delegates throughout the Roman Empire. Remember, the church was still a persecuted church when it was first formed. The churches were existing within the Roman Empire. And the churches could send delegates to these council meetings. Now, churches did communicate to one another, and they communicated with the apostles. Why they communicate? They communicated for doctrinal and practical decisions when necessary. We, however, do not find churches reporting to say the mother church in Jerusalem. Pentecost happened, the church was formed, and it happened in Jerusalem. So we could say that was the first church, but it was never called the mother church was never a church that had to have any type of authority over any other church. What we see in our New Testament is that every church that was set up was autonomous and independent in and of itself by God's design. <coughs> and there was no reporting back to the mothership, if you will. Martin Luther, during the Reformation, declared that all men were priests. Were all men, all men were priests by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And the reformers turned the traditions of men upside down. Can you imagine the priesthood at the time and Martin Luther telling the commoners like us that we were all priests? 
they probably laughed. Then their laughter probably turned to anger because they couldn't stop the Reformation. They couldn't stop this period in our history when the truth of the gospel set people free, where they could actually go to God and talk to him without having to go to a man and be under control. Martin Luther started that in the Reformation. Every man was a priest. This included then the Anabaptists, the Baptists, the Quakers, the Mennonites, the Brethren, and others the same. Congregationalists rejected Rome's claim of St. Peter's primacy. Now, if you go to any Roman Catholic church, any Orthodox church, probably one of the stained glass windows has a picture of Peter because he's the man. He's the guy that holds the key to the church. We still tell jokes today that when you get to the gates of heaven, who's waiting for you there? St. Peter. And the Congregationalists rejected. St. Peter was no better than any other person. He's just a brother in the faith like you and me. That probably ticked the people off who still today venerate St. Peter's um, selection and primacy. We go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, to kind of knock down this idea that Peter's the man. But it shall not be so among you, if you read previous verses, it's talking about Peter. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. You want to be a leader for God today, you will come with the attitude of a servant. Jesus set the example when he knelt down and began to wash his disciples' feet at communion. What, what, what was their attitude when Jesus kneeled down to start doing that? Were they, were they happy? Did they lounge back and let him do it? They're like, oh, it's about time, Jesus. No. They said, no, 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 no. I sh you shouldn't be washing my feet. I should be washing yours. And Jesus said, All, anyone who wants to enter the kingdom must humble themselves and, and let me serve them. Okay, Jesus, don't just wash my feet then. Wash my entire body. If we want to serve Jesus, we come in the attitude of a servant, where we put everyone else, treat everyone else better than ourselves. That's the example that he gave us. Not to venerate somebody, not to hold even your pastor up on a pedestal and say, he's greater than anyone else. I just have a different role than you do. God's eyes were equal treated each other with respect and honor and to minister to one another. In Acts chapter 1 verse 20, I want to show you a place where even this idea of bishop needed to be properly translated. So remember the 12 disciples, remember the one that betrayed Jesus named Judas. Okay, and Christ always wanted it to be 12, and after Judas committed suicide, he needed a replacement. Two men were chosen. Men cast their lots, and one, Matthias, replaced Judas. In Acts chapter 1, verse 20, in our King James Bible, it says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let this habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop prick, let another take. And this is all... Uh, uh, a picture of Judas, a prediction that Judas, this man Judas, would exist, that his office would need to be placed. Understand that everyone who interpreted the King James Bible were bishops in the Episcopal system. So they wanted to keep this idea of bishops around, but the proper translation you can see in pretty much any other translation it was translated, his office, let another take. I want you to see it's a title of an office, not necessarily person. And when Judas died, we read the apostles cast lots on two men, Matthias winning the lot. We read that in the early church, they were ministering out all the food. They said, we don't have time to do this as apostles. Someone else needs to do this. And the apostles chose from with, within the body seven deacons. 
How did they get in? They were filled by popular vote. What does that mean? It means the church government exists. It means that the congregation has a say in how church government goes. If it wasn't so, the head bishop would appoint everyone. You guys wouldn't have a say in it. Not the way that God designed it. Not the way we see it in the early church. Even the Jerusalem Council uh, was delegated members who were only advisory members. And they couldn't force a decision at Antioch. When a very important theme came forward, are we allowed to let people in the church who are not circumcised? Oh, I don't know. So they sent word back to Jerusalem saying, what should we do? Jerusalem council gave them their council. Again, it was advisory, but the church of Antioch ultimately got to make the decision about who they led into membership. I'm bringing all this up because I want you to see that God created church government to be participatory. We all have a say in how the local body goes. We say how we should worship. We get to decide how we discipline. We get to decide uh, membership and how that gets rolled out or doesn't get rolled out, who gets to be membership, who doesn't, um, who we get to consider a member in good standing. All of that is written into our bylaws and constitution, but as a body, we should probably every once in a while relook at that and say, are we still in agreement with the way it's been written? Congregationalists behold several things. I want to go through some verses. I pray that it's an encouragement to you this morning, um, especially as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Just bask in the blessedness that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and he made us to be a kingdom. We're a kingdom to be priests. Unto his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This would be a throw in the face of people in that time who were currently sitting in kingship and currently sitting in priesthood. For this to be read to them and said, no, no, no. Everyone is a priest and a king now. Because they're in Jesus Christ. See, we call him King Jesus, amen? For he is a king. And we are now in Jesus, and he calls us his brothers and sisters. Do you know what that means? We're all kings. We've all been given that royal authority, it's now ours. When you're feeling down, remind yourself that you're a king and a queen and a priest, a royal priesthood. We find that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. We are his possession. That's why we don't have to worry about being possessed by anything else. Because he has come into us. We are his possession. And he has filled us completely. There is no room for anything besides his holy habitation. That ye may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I couple this verse with him calling us ambassadors. We're his personal representation of heaven here on earth. An elect race. What's our race? Well, there's two races on planet earth. There's the Adamic race, 
We were all born into Adam, born into sin, born into eternal damnation. By the grace of Jesus Christ, he plucked us out of Adam and placed us into Jesus. And now we are the race of Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the Holy One. Amen? That's you and me. How holy are we? If I had to ask you who's the most righteous person on planet Earth, who's the most righteous being that you know, I think all of us would quickly say Jesus Christ. He's the only one that was the perfect sacrifice. Well, we read in our Bible that you are equally as righteous as Jesus. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, himself man, Christ Jesus. We're in him, he's in us, and he is at equal standing with God. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ in you. But I haven't gone to seminary, brother. I I don't understand all the parts of the Bible. Things are confusing to me. I think I need a pastor to tell me what it means. You know that in the Episcopal system, even today, scripture in many settings is still read in a language that no one in the congregation can speak. That after it's read in this secret language, which isn't secret, it's Latin. Then they wait for the priest to interpret it and tell the people sitting in the pews what they should think about it. I praise God we have a Bible written in English. I praise God that we can trust that it's infallible and without error, that everything that God wanted us to know that is in it, and that he has given us exclusively the power, the ability to read it for ourselves and, get this folks, understand it. That if you were the last person on planet earth and you had a Bible, you wouldn't need someone to tell you what it means. You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. Now the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot know them, because they are spiritually judged. This is the truth about you and me before we knew Jesus. Someone read us something, a story out of the Bible we heard, and we're like, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's foolishness. And I would witness to my friends that didn't know Jesus, they'd make a mockery of the scripture. They didn't know. The words wouldn't make sense. They were spiritually dead. They're not going to get it. Look at the second half of this passages. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. We're spiritual. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, and he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. The Bible tells us elsewhere, when we pray in utterances, when we pray, and we don't even know where to start when we're so distraught, how many of you have started a prayer, Jesus Christ, oh! See, I can understand the words Jesus Christ, but what does the oh mean? What does the mean? See, that's the Holy Spirit inside you can interpret your utterances to God. The Holy Spirit knows what you're going through. The Holy Spirit knows your size. You have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things, the Bible says. That means that you and I can independently understand the scriptures. We don't need a universal bishop to tell us. 
Same Holy Spirit that's in you is the same Holy Spirit that is in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 speaks of the pastor teacher an office in the church. Again, this idea that government exists. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors backslash teachers. I would call pastor teachers. So we see this office and we'll explore this office more next week. But Hebrews 13, 17 tells us as a local body, there's something you must do with your pastor teacher. Obey them that have rule over you, submit to them, for they watch in behalf of your souls. As they that shall give account that they may do this with joy and not with grief, for this were unprofitable for you. We often say when a president gets elected, we say things like, you get what you voted for. Um, this is what you asked for. Elections have consequences, right? Within the body of Christ, when you vote on a pastor, you are saying that you are willing to follow this person as your leader. Now, this obedience, as stated here in Hebrew, should never hinder the practical outworking of your individual priesthood of the believer. I don't have an extra measure of the Holy Spirit. You elected me as your pastor teacher. You should trust that God is leading me in the right direction. When it's apparent that he is not, that's when you pull me aside and practice church discipline. If I don't listen to you, you grab two more people and you come visit me again. If I don't listen to you, then you take it in front of the church. And if I don't listen to the church, practice church discipline with your pastor. That's how it works. You don't have that option if you're in a different church system. Other people get to make those decisions. We go back to the corrupt dictatorship when charged with a crime. We've investigated ourselves and we found no wrongdoing. Everyone sits back and says, man, is this the way it's supposed to be? And it's not. It's not the way God designed it. Whether government is pastors or deacons or a ruling board of elders and serving deacons, God should always be the head and the Holy Spirit must be free to work uninhibited within the body. I looked at the other part of this verse in Hebrews 13, 17. See, we have to give an account. I have to give an account to you. But we obey our leaders that they may do this with joy and not with grief. I know some pastors that grieve. <laughs> um, the way their body works with them, the way their deacon boards work with them is not pleasant. And, and it says that they should do this with joy and not with grief, for if they do it with grief, it's not profitable to the body. If you guys are treating a pastor, or if a church treats a pastor not so good, it doesn't help you guys out anymore. To have a pastor who doesn't even want to be behind the lectern on a Sunday morning, who doesn't want to answer your phone calls throughout the week, who doesn't want to take care of the administration and all the other things that pastors do. And I've said this for a long time. 
thank you for treating me and my family with love and care. We've had trying times, but I can say that the majority of my time here has been nothing short of a joy. And I look forward to being with my family. I have pastors I talked to. One guy was retiring. And he, he goes, I have administered, and he went through his 42 years of ministry. I think he was up to 582 deacons meetings. And he didn't say with joy on his face. <laughs> Listen, I, I try not to make any big decisions alone. Try to bring the men in. I try to bring you guys in on these decisions because it's our church. It's our authority given to us by God to make these decisions. I enjoy spending time with my deacon, my trustees, presenting things to them and getting their feedback talking to others within the body, getting their feedback. This is the way God had designed the church to be. But we can openly communicate to one another. Deacons and elders and bishops and pastor teachers can work together. When this happens, when, when this body of leadership puts God as the head and the Holy Spirit free to work uninhibited within the body, some wonderful things happen. First, we see a multiplication of conversions. Acts chapter 6, verse 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem exceedingly. A great company of priests were obedient to the faith. You guys see that term priests? It's talking about us. The moment you got saved, you became a priest. What do priests do? Spread the gospel. Acts 8, 4. They, therefore, that were scattered abroad, went about preaching the word. Early believers realized that it was their individual responsibility, no matter how young they were, how old they were. I have a responsibility to spread the gospel message wherever I go. Whether I be locked up in a prison in a foreign land, persecuted, or in my hometown with my relatives and loving neighbors. You guys see how it increased so quick? People weren't waiting around for the great eloquent evangelist to show up. No, no, no. It's my job, my duty. Conversions increased. What else do we see? Holy Spirit speaking to every believer's conscience. As a pastor, I can preach. As a pastor, I can teach. I can exhort. I can build up. But I cannot compel any of you in the faith. If I could, I would. I think that would be awesome if I could just compel you into faith. I can't do it. It's the Holy Spirit talking to each and every one of you. Reminding you of who you are, whose you are. Opening up to you your spiritual gifts so that you can minister to others in the body. And in doing so, fulfill the law of Christ. Preach, I can teach, but the Holy Spirit can only do what the Holy Spirit does. And in a church where the leadership is working well together and submitting to the head, this is going to happen. You're going to be compelled through faith to do something within this body, whether it's talk to another individual, whether it's to build some wants, whether it's to sneak 100 bucks into someone's back pocket, whether it's to go and minister to them, send a card, send a text, go mow their grass. Go take them somewhere. God's going to tell you to do that. Whatever your gift is that he's given to you. Trust the Holy Spirit. He does it through the word. I preach the word and the Holy Spirit uses the word to talk to you. Build you up. 
for the ministry. We also see, and you can read Romans chapter 14, 4 through 7, where it's basically saying you can't tell people not to do something. The Holy Spirit gets to do that and that alone. Thirdly, believers will see them exercising their gifts. Balance is necessary in relationships between the offices in the local church. I've seen imbalance in Baptist churches where the pastor is, the pastoral authority is emphasized so much the Baptist preacher looks more like a dictator than a minister. And anyone that speaks against them is immediately dealt with in a harsh way or even kicked out of the church because you said something against the pastor. Looks more like a Roman Catholic church than a true church sovereignty of the New Testament. So balance comes from the body submitting to the head Christ. And responding accordingly. That's everybody in the body. That's what balance looks like. All of us trusting the head, God, and then responding accordingly. It's a two way function between the head and body. It's really an example of love. When the body is healthy, the members love to obey. When the body is healthy, the members love to obey. They share needs and desires with each other. They share them with the head Christ. That's a sign of healthiness. You've been secretly praying about something in your heart. And another brother and sister within the body just happened to be talking to them. And they say, I've been thinking about the same thing. Bam. That's God working in the body. Touching shoulders of people within. Stirring hearts so that when it comes time to present it, everyone's all ready for it. Isn't that awesome? I've seen it many times. It's a place where members are not jealous of other members' gifts or assignments. Amen. Awesome. So glad that you're heading up that ministry. Not jealous. Not upset that I wasn't chosen. I'm happy where God has me. What he has me doing. Instead of jealousy, they rejoice together. God as the head. Decisions are made on the basis of a powerful sense of unity in the spirit and not by majority rule. One pastor's testimony said, first 10 years of my pastoral ministry, I realized that I wasn't allowing the head, God, to rule the church. Said every decision we made, it was a decision made by a man. Talk to the deacons. All the deacons would debate it. Every program we launched was all a men's design. Said, oh, sure, we would at the end of every meeting bow our heads in prayer, asking God to bless our decision and rubber stamp it, make it look spiritual. Instead of waiting for this powerful sense of unity in the spirit. Big decisions, folks. What I'd rather say and what I plan to do if it poses itself is present the problem to you as a body. Tell you to get out of here and go pray. We're not even going to make a decision right now. Pray about it. We trust the Holy Spirit will give us a unified answer when we come back again to talk about it. 
That should bring peace to our hearts. No matter if the system of church government is congregational, presbyterial, and a lot of our church bodies, a lot of our sister churches, they have elders, they have elder boards that help operate. We have deacons and trustees. Doesn't mean that we can't have it. The Bible is clear about a plurality of leadership, that it shouldn't just be necessarily one person. That's why I try to defer to my leaders as much as possible. If God allows us someday to get bigger, awesome. Bring in another pastor teacher. So those two can help lead instead of just one. No matter if it's congregational, presbyterial, body life must not be restricted. Each believer should be free to listen to the head, that is God Almighty, use their gifts as Christ directs them to within the body to bless. Let's bow in prayer and remain seated where you are this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for church government. Help us to see 